they sang praises to God. And how the, the Apostle Paul, who talked about uh, 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 the joy, how in the midst of his tribulation, he, he, he joyed in the midst of it. And how that uh, in the midst of all these things we've been talking about, he said, we're, we're more than conquerors. <clears throat> the Bible says in Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now look, that is not just a suggestion. It's more than a suggestion. He says, look, let it be put away from you. Put it away. Now, if we're commanded in the Bible to do something, God's commands are his enablings. <clears throat> that bitterness has been defined as settled anger, uh, a settled hurt. It's that hurt that happened to you and you held on to it. And, and it's not to to blow off or brush aside the hurt that you've been through. I, I would not dare try to minimize that. However, the bitterness comes in when we take that hurt and, and we hold on to it and we don't get past it. It says to also put away uh, the anger. That has to do with those first risings of disgust when somebody injures you uh, uh, or like when you, when you hit your finger with a hammer. Uh, does anger flare up in you? It does me. Boy, I, and I dance all over the place. That wrath, it says to put away. That has to do with that passion of heated anger. The clamor, it says to put away. That has to do with the disorder and loud words that result from anger. That arguing, that being, in, that being boisterous and hollering out. Boy, I just can't stand to be around that stuff. Uh, I, I was around enough of that when I was young. I, I, uh, when they start arguing in my house, I like, hear, hey, hey, hey. No, we're not going to have that. We're not going to have that in this house. I had it enough when I grew up. I, I'm not having it here. Uh, we're not going to have that hollering. We're not going to have that arguing. Uh, Y'all can talk it out or duke it out, but uh, uh, don't do that around me. I, I, I need some peace. <clears throat> the evil speaking, it says to put away. That's the speaking ill of the one who has offended you, such as slander, maybe backbiting, tailbearing. The malice is the attitude that we have that desires to bring harm against someone. Now tonight we're, we're keying in on this one thing here, this thing called bitterness. The Bible says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now look at the next verse. <coughs> and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know, I believe that God longs to use his people in a greater way than we allow him to use us. I believe that God wants to bless us and comfort us and encourage us and strengthen us far more than we allow him to. I believe that God wants to send revival. And we would say, we look at America and we would say, oh, well, God's not going to send revival because look at all the, the, the murdering of the babies and, and sexuality and this, that, and it. you know, but I don't think that's what's holding revival back. See, most of those are the lost. Those that are holding revival back are sitting in this room tonight and in churches all over America. You see, it's those sins that we paint up and justify. The, the sin of harboring that anger, that bitterness. And by the way, bitterness, uh, you know, just about every sin, if not every sin, you can trace right back to pride. I don't know if you realize that. If you just trace it back, somewhere along the line, pride's involved. And that bitterness, we, we're hurt, and because of how somebody treated me and we're consumed with how I'm treated, I hold on to that and I become bitter. You know, I believe that God cannot send revival and cannot bless because of the hidden sins of our hearts. The ones that aren't so obvious. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart doeth good, or it maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. So the, the, the merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. I've been told more than once, I've heard more than once, that the mind cannot distinguish between real laughter and laughter that you're just faking. 
that the body reacts the same both ways. <clears throat> a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Everybody do me a favor. Would you smile? I don't, uh, however bad it is, you can make yourself do this. You know you can laugh today. I'll be honest. Past few days, ever since I started this series, talking about depression and anxiety and bitterness, I want you, man. The, my wife said to me, "Liz, can you end this series?" I said, "Why?" She said, "Because the devil's been all over my back since you started teaching it." I said, "Mine too." I mean, life just stinks. This is terrible. And but one thing after another has been happening. You know what I did in my office today? I was starting to get a little down, Danny. I'll be honest with you. I just thought and I said, well, "Let's give it a shot." <laughs> <laughs> well, now I can't stop. I just started laughing. You know what? I felt pretty good. <laughs> I got on YouTube and I looked up this old song we used to sing uh, years ago. I used to hear this song. Well, my name is Ticklish Reuben. We're from way back in old Vermont. I've been tickled by almost everything. You ever heard that? No, I heard. I've been tickled by a feather. I've been tickled by a wasp. I've been tickled by the yellow bumblebee. Then he starts laughing. <laughs> I used to sing that to these kids at camp. You know what? I couldn't finish the song because I'd really be laughing. What happened? I determined to take my eyes off of the problems. No, the problems were still there. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Proverbs 15, 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So you see, we, we can take medicine. And God gives us a medication right here. What is it? Uh, oh Lord, I, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm bitter, I'm angry, I'm mad, I'm scared, I need something. He says, okay, here, here's, here's a prescription. I'll, I'll, you want one dose of a merry heart. Now here's the problem. Say, preacher, I want to have a merry heart but I can't get past the depression to have the merry heart. I can't get past the anxiety to have the merry heart. I can't get past the bitterness to have the merry heart. How do I get to that point? We read the word bitterness in the Bible. Our concept of bitterness is that uh, uh, something of a sharp, unpleasant taste. We speak of something being bitter if it causes grief or it's hard to bear. We speak of bitter defeat, a bitter loss, a bitter death, a bitter failure. We speak of, well, they fought to the bitter end. In other words, they, they gave it all they had, and it was a long, hard fight, and they wore themselves out. They fought all the way to the end. Bitterness has come to, to be used to describe things that can cause grief or pain. We speak of bitter words, bitter enemies. They hurt us. Those bitter words, and we say, oh, don't let words hurt you. Well, let me tell you, maybe you shouldn't let them, but they do, don't they? Well, words cut deep. Words cut real deep. <clears throat> when someone struggles, as I said, uh, in the, end, the very end, given all that they have, we say they fought to the bitter end. In the Word of God, the word bitterness most often refers to an intense suffering of body, mind, or soul, or maybe all three. First Samuel 10, uh, or chapter 1, verse 10 the Bible speaks of Hannah. She did not have a son. And, and uh, uh, the other ladies mocking her and making fun of her. And the Bible says, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. In Proverbs 17, 25, the Bible says this, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. Now, as we read these verses, I want you to notice something. Bitterness is not something that just happens, boom, one day. You're all, well, hey, I'm bitter. One action and it, boy, I'm bitter. No, bitterness comes, it's a, it's a process. The Bible speaks of that root of bitterness. Bitterness is something that grows if we give it the time to grow. Notice, uh, she was in bitterness of soul. She had not had a child. Man, that had been years in the making. Uh, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. All along this son is behaving foolishly and foolishly and oh, it's breaking his mom's heart and she's not turning from it and she becomes bitter in her soul. <clears throat> in Lamentations 1.4, 
the uh, uh, children of Israel had been under the judgment of God. The Bible says the ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feast. All her gates are desolate, her priests, our virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. That was their response to the judgment. Instead of turning to God, they became bitter towards him. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. By the way, degeneracy is always, follow, or not always, but is often followed by bitterness. You turn your back on the Lord, you decide, I'm hanging it up, I'm tired of this, I'm going to go do my own thing, and you begin to wander out into sin. Now listen, the world, many of you got saved from a life in the world. I understand, I, I, I've not been there. I, I got saved when I was 13 years old. I thank God for that. That same world you left, it's not any better. It is worse. And you young people, listen, you, you, you think, well, I, I've got all the answers. I know the loopholes, and boy, it'll not deal me this bad hand. And you go out in this world, and you do all that the world has to offer, and, and you think, well, I'll not end up with the heartaches they have. Yeah, you will. It's going to chew you up and spit you out. <clears throat> the thing is, it won't all happen at once. It'll be little by little by little drawing you in until your end is bitterness. Colossians 3.19, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. Sometimes we become bitter by the way a spouse treats us. They're not just a spouse, anybody, those hurt feelings. Hebrews 12.15 says this, <clears throat> looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now when Paul writes this, He's quoting from or, or using, alluding to Deuteronomy 29, 18 where Moses said this. When he's speaking of idolatry, he said, uh, uh, listen, if it starts to creep up, if it starts to spring up a root of that idolatry, worship another God starts to pop up. Boy, I, I, you need to get it out of there. And listen to what he says. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Now where Paul used uh, uh, bitterness, Moses uses the words gall and wormwood. In that passage, Paul, or, or Moses, was speaking of idolatry as the root that bears gall and wormwood. Uh, to use the terms gall and wormwood was to express this, that it was something deadly, it was something poisonous. And God's telling Moses, listen, if there's a, a root of that idolatry springing up, you need to get it out of there. It is poison. It'll spread. It is death. Moses speaks of the result of allowing that root of idolatry to spring up as, uh, among God's people. So Paul tells us that the root of bitterness also spreads to affect others. And when he's using that word bitterness there, it coincides with that gall and wormwood. It means it's poison. Somebody's hurt you. They've offended you. You hold on to that offense instead of dealing with it and getting by it. And I'm not saying that to minimize it or to say that it's easy. But you hold on to it. Listen, and that root, it, it takes root in your heart. That's the beginning of bitterness. And it is poison to you. Some of you battle with it even now. And it is doing nothing but destroying you. Somebody offended you. Somebody betrayed your trust. Somebody did something that was wrong. And you've never got past it. And you hold on to it. And every day you, you, you bring it before your mind. And you labor on it. And every time you see this person, it, 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 you just replay it all over in your mind what happened. And it's, it's destroying you. <clears throat> Basically, bitterness is this. It's a natural emotion. It starts with a natural emotion, whether that's anger, whether that's a mistrust. It starts with a natural emotion that is not dealt with and it is allowed to fester and to grow. Now look, not only is it hurting you, 
but it's, it's keeping God from God's blessings from your life. It most often results from being hurt. Those hurts can come from direct abuse by somebody, maybe when you're younger. It can come from abandonment, betrayal, maybe a verbal assault, a violation of trust, an unexpected loss, and many other things. Those emotions of sadness and hurt, hey, those are those are, are natural. God gave us those, and it's actually for our protection. It, it, it kicks in with that fight or flight. Uh, okay, I either need to get away from this or I need to deal with it right now. But what we do, and, and boy, when we, we enter that part of our life, that fight or flight uh, uh, scenario of our life, boy, our, our bodies, it, it produces all these hormones and it gets us all out of whack and our blood pressure rises and our body temperature rises, and that's okay. That's for our good for a little, about, a little bit of time. But our bodies were not meant to stay in that uh, condition. The emotions of sadness and hurt are natural emotions, but they've got to be dealt with, not, not dismissed, not ignored. They've got to be dealt with, and then you've got to move past those times. If that natural emotion is allowed to take control of our life, that's when the bitterness says it. Not just bitterness with people, but sometimes we get bitter towards God. Children of Israel were. And then it begins to produce its fruit. Bitterness does. It sets in over time. The effects of bitterness, boy, there's physical effects. Uh, There's headaches, muscle soreness, arthritis, heart problems, stomach problems. You name it, the list goes on and on. Spiritually, it affects your relationship with God. Man, listen, we, if you're living in bitterness, you could, you could sit there and, boy, the greatest preacher in the world come and look, Jesus himself could come and preach. And you may not get a thing out of it. Because that bitterness has taken over your heart and all you can focus on now is not what is God wanting to do for me, but what has this person done against me? And that becomes the defining point in your life. Psalm 100, verse 4. Listen to what this says. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. That was written by a man who had a lot of heartaches. One son molested a daughter, uh, his daughter, and then another son killed that son. Then this son that killed that son, David banished him for a while. Then he had him back, had nothing to do with him. He ended up uh, uh, ousting David off the throne and chasing him, trying to kill him. And then somebody killed that son. David had a lot of heartache. And yet he was able to say, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. We can't do that when we're bitter. We're commanded to. But when bitterness takes control, we can't. When I was young, I came from a broken home. My father left when I was three years old. I do not remember seeing him again, although I went to visit him. I do not remember seeing him. I remember seeing his new wife and her daughters. I don't remember seeing him. I don't remember seeing him again until I was around, I don't remember, maybe in my young 30s. You know, I, there were times that I would, man, I, I, I would daydream. Boy, I hope he comes knocks on the door one day. I'm going to blast him. Now, look, by the way, we have a good relationship now. He got saved. He made contact with me. Man, he's living for God. He's doing great. Boy, I love him. We have a good relationship. There were times I'd dwell on it. I became bitter. <clears throat> there was a, a, a fella back in Charlotte that said some very hurtful things about my family. To the point that I was ready just to blast him. I, I, I was going to get him in the preacher's office and just and, and let him have it. And I was going to confront him about what he had said. And if he said, yes, that's what I said. I'd already planned it. I was going to sit on the other side of the office. Was, he had a, 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 a shallow but long office. And so I was going to sit on the other side where I could get a good run and start. And I was going to run and I was going to jump and I was going to just elbow. Bam! Knock him out of the chair. Then I was going to straddle him. 
right in the preacher's office, and, and I was just going to wear him out and, and until the preacher pulled me off, and then I was going to say, I'm sorry, preacher, I had to do that, and, uh, but I, I'll go ahead and resign so you don't have to fire me. And then I was going to walk out feeling pretty good about it. And boy, I began to daily run over in my mind. I, I knew that guy for a long time, and I knew so much junk about him. And I thought, man, I, I've been a good friend to him, and you know what, I'm just going to let it all out. In my mind, I began to catalog everything he had done since he was a teenager. You know what happened? I became bitter. You know, I, I didn't smile as much. I became short-tempered and ill-tempered with my own family, the ones I was trying to protect. Because I harbored that bitterness. <clears throat> Colossians 2 7, rooted and built up in Him, not rooted in bitterness, but rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Preacher, think, I've had a hard life, I know, but you've had a life. Surely there's been something good. I, I read a, a something today. said most people don't see the silver lining because they're too busy looking for gold. You're looking for perfection. It doesn't exist. I, I can't tell you how much, it did, how much good it did in my heart Sunday when I, I uh, Justin, when I said, anybody want to brag on the Lord? We just lost her baby. Well, I said, we didn't lose her, did we? We know right where she is. He raised his hand. He said, I want to thank God for letting her live six and a half hours so that we could hold her. Hey, I, I don't want to know. That's helped me all week, brother. If I start feeling down and out, I think about you doing that and think, man, that guy's not going to have more joy than I am. Listen to James 4 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. But when we're bitter, we don't even feel like praying, do we? Be honest. I don't feel like reading that Bible. Bitterness like a cancer spreads throughout your entire being. And when you're bitter about one thing, before long that bitterness will begin to take over your life. You'll become bitter about many things, and you will be bitter towards many people that have not even harmed you. Listen to what he says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart. You double-minded. One reason God can't send revival is because our hearts aren't pure. They're filled with bitterness, and deceit, and sin. Listen to Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When I'm bitter, what I'm basically saying is, God, I do not trust that you know what is best for me. And when I'm bitter and I'm holding on to that hurt, I'm saying, God, I do not believe that you're strong enough to help me. And I know you sent your Holy Spirit to be my comforter, but I do not believe that you can comfort me. We can't even have faith in God like we want to have or should have. This bitterness not only does it affect us physically and it affects us spiritually, it affects us socially. Notice that verse where it says, of the root of bitterness springing up and thereby, what? Many be defiled. You wonder why your husband's bitter or upset, grumpy. Could it be your bitterness has spread? Wonder why your child is. Look, you, you come sit in the house of God, and we worship. If we ought to be able to praise God anywhere, it's here. If we ought to be able to worship God anywhere, it's here. We can do it anywhere, but if anywhere at all to be here, if if there's people that we should feel good around it, if anywhere it, it ought to be here amongst our our church family. Come in and you plop down, cross your eye or cross your eyes. I wonder why people look at you funny. 
I, I knew this girl one time, Tyler. She was so cross-eyed when she cried, her tears ran down her back. The doctor said she had bacteria. Uh, <laughs> I know that was corny, wasn't it, boo? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> hey, listen. <laughs> that was so stupid. <laughs> Wrong place. When you become bitter, your life is then defined by the offense that is committed against you. But for a Christian, our life ought to be defined by Christ. And you get this bitterness and you come and you sit down and, and the younger people, they're looking at you. They're thinking, hey, the preacher's talking about how to have the joy of the Lord. Look at that person. Man, you, you're miserable. Preacher, you don't understand what I've been going through. No, I don't. I, I can't pre pretend to. I understand what this book says. No one wants to be around someone that's bitter. I don't want to be around somebody that's always grumpy, that always sees the negative, because the bitter person takes it out on everyone at one time or another. Well, this person hurt me. Look, you ever? I, I, one time we, we, we left our house in the morning when I lived in Charlotte, uh, um, uh, down there on Kendrick Avenue, and there was a, a, a wounded dog in my yard. It was a child. Well, I didn't realize he was wounded. It was just this black child laying there. And uh, I, I'm not scared of dogs, but I do respect them very much. <clears throat> and so when we, we left, we came back at the end of the day. He was laying in the same spot. Man, that's a wounded animal. Now, what happens if you try to help a wounded animal? A lot of times you're going to get bit. Doesn't matter if you're trying to help. Doesn't matter if you're not the one that hurt him. A bitter person's that same way. That bitter, a, a bitter person, not just a hurt person, but someone who's taken that hurt and they've held on to it and they've refused to just to, to try to deal with it and get past it. Well, they'll take it out on anybody that gets close to them. Nobody wants to be around a bitter person. The bitterness, by the way, rubs off on those around you. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and it said it also in the Gospels, Jesus said it speaking of, uh, of doctrine, uh, but here it's used in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? That attitude is contagious. A bitter heart and a bitter soul, it's contagious. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your business. It will destroy friendships. It will destroy your walk with the Lord. Okay, preacher, I see. So what do I do? Number one, that's what I spoke about last week. You've got to deal with it. You can't dismiss it. You can't ignore it and say it's not there. You've got to meet it face on. We're more than conquerors. Listen, somebody hurts you, yeah, you're angry. Take your time to be angry. Vent for a while, but refuse to stay there. Don't stay there. Number two, leave it in God's hands. Now, here's the problem that makes it hard. We keep wanting to go back and take it out of his hands. But leave it in God's hands. Joseph was an example of this in the Bible. Listen, Joseph's family sold him into slavery. Then his, his employer's wife lied about him, had him thrown in prison. Joseph had it tough. But listen to what he says in, in jo Genesis chapter 50, verse number 19. And Joseph, he's talking to his brothers now. Boy, they're scared. Boy, Joseph's going to kill us. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? Joseph acknowledged that it was God's place to pass the judgment. It was God's place to get the vengeance, not his place. Here's what Joseph is saying. Hey, you're my brothers. You did me wrong, but I'm not God. You hurt me, but you didn't sin against me. You sinned against God. I, I can't do anything about it. He gave it to God. God, this is your problem. You deal with it. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, the next verse, he says, But as for you, 
ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph saw God's hand at work in his adversity. He said, here's a hurt. I've been wounded. Man, the people that ought to love me most, they sold me into slavery. I heard them speak of killing me. Okay, God, I'm leaving that in your hands. And then he stepped back and he told his brothers, listen, I'm not God. And by the way, you meant to hurt me, but God used it to bring about a blessing so I can save many people alive. The next verse, verse number 21, Genesis 50. Now, therefore, fear ye not. Listen to what Joseph says. And let me ask you, what would you do? He's the second most powerful man in the land at this point. Anything he says goes. He could have them executed. What would you do? Hey, 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 come here. Off with their heads. Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Did you hear that? If anybody had a reason to be bitter, Joseph did. They said, look, don't be afraid. I'm going to nourish you. And I'm going to nourish your children. And then, now look, remember, he was the one hurt. What did he do? He comforted them. And then he spake kindly unto them. Joseph showed genuine love and concern for the ones who had hurt him. Right now, I am about sure I left my windows down in my car. Well, we'll put some catfish in it and charge people to fish. Here's the proper response. Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Here, here's an answer. Okay, It says, don't let a root of bitterness, man, that is really tearing my nerves up. Hey, th- 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 throw that to my son back there or something. and uh, Don't hit anybody, please. Okay. Okay. Wow. Here's the proper response. Don't let a root of bitterness spring up. He says, but be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Here's the first thing you do. Be kind. Be kind. But pastor, they hurt me, okay? Then get your anger out, vent, do something, uh, get a sledgehammer, uh, 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 beat their windows out, key their car, do something. Just get, no, don't really do that. Just, somebody right now is like, yes, preacher gave me permission. Be kind. Be kind. Next, tenderhearted. Pray that God would give you a tender heart towards the ones that have hurt you or wronged you. Now, this thing of forget, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Have, pray that God will give you a tender heart. And by the way, that will have to be a work of God. Pastor, you ever struggle with this? Yeah. There's, there, there are certain people that to hear their name, I, I, I can about feel my blood pressure go up. Preacher, are you bitter? No, I, I'm not. I don't dwell day by day. I don't dwell on it. I, I pray for them. I say, God help me. My blood pressure is going up. Number three, be willing to forgive. Now. We'll cover forgiveness in another lesson all on its own. I I do not uh, buy the you must forgive and forget. I've not learned how to do the forgetting part. And some things we shouldn't forget. Uh, You you mess with my child. I don't need to forget. You know, somebody's a child molester. I don't need to forget that and then say, okay, I want you to work in junior church. Okay, That's, that's not good. But we've got to be willing to forgive. Can I tell you something about forgiveness? 
If brother Barry offends me, me forgiving him, that's not for his benefit. That's for my benefit. It's not that it's for his benefit. Well, bless his heart. I'm just going to forgive him. Bless his heart. No, no, no. Okay, I'm going to forgive him because I don't want to become bitter. I, I'm not going to let, by the way, if I cannot get to that point, then he controls me the rest of my life. There are some in here, I'm sure, that, that were wounded in some serious ways when you were young. I'm not glossing over that and saying, and not trying to downplay it one bit. I understand that hurts. It's bad. But if you cannot get to the point where you're willing to say, okay, God, here, you take it. I'm not living here anymore. Then that person controls you the rest of your life. I don't know about you, but I don't want somebody that hurt me to have the, the satisfaction of controlling me. I want to be controlled by my father. So I, I need to be kind. I need to pray and ask God to give me a tender heart. I need to, to be willing to forgive. Paul is a good example of this. He kept preaching the good news to the very ones that hurt him. Listen to what he says. Are you speaking of a tender heart? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But Paul, they stoned you, they beat you. Oh, but oh, I want them to be saved. Listen to this in Romans chapter 9, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He said, I want them to be saved. So that these that have they've cursed me and they've mocked me and they've tried to kill me, but I want them to be saved so bad that if I could relinquish my salvation so that they could be saved, if I could go to hell so that they could go to heaven, I, I would do it. Paul, you're kidding. They've hurt you. Paul wasn't going to live in that hurt. He was more than conqueror. Jesus is the best example of it. He came into his own, and his own received him not. They mocked him. They crucified him. His very disciples that traveled with him for those three years, they turned and ran. They didn't stick around to help him. 1 Peter 2, 21, For even here in two were ye called, listen to these verses, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed, him, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So boy, they, they've done me wrong, but hey, God, into your hands I commit my spirit. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Christ, nobody could ever say that he, his life was defined by bitterness. If I'm going to be a Christian, then I can't be bitter. That bitterness will keep you from serving God. That bitterness will keep you from having the blessings of God. That bitterness will keep you from having the joy of the Lord. Pastor, you make it sound so easy. No, I don't mean to. I know it's not easy, but you've got to somehow get to the point where like Joseph did, you realize, okay, this is God's to handle. Remember what he said? Vengeance is mine saith the Lord, I will repay, not me, him. Well, I'm going to get him one day. Oh, that's bitterness. And it's not doing you a lick of good. And it's not doing your children a lick of good. It's not doing your spouse a lick of good. Those co it's not doing them a lick of good. It's going to destroy you from the inside out. 
So whatever it is that you're holding on to, give it to God. Give Him the opportunity to show Himself mighty in your life. Bow your head and close your eyes, please.